Good morning. Um, side note, I have a set here of the New Testament on, on uh, CD, the complete New Testament on CD. Uh, it's practically brand new. If any of you would like to have it, just come up here and see me and I'll give it to you, okay? All right, we're going to review a little bit. An easy way to, re to, to wrap our minds around the book of Acts uh, is the number two. So, Someone tell me one of the twos um, that helps us remember the book of Acts, outline the book of Acts, uh, get a handle on the book of Acts. What's one of them? Okay, two people. The first half is Peter. What's the two cities? Okay, what else? Two churches, very good. And where are they at? Where's the two churches? Same, same place. Jerusalem, Antioch. Um, two books. What's the two books? Luke and Acts. All right. So if we remember that it's a two-book series, that also helps us to remember then who wrote the book of Acts. Who wrote the book of Acts? The Luke, right? Because it's Luke-Acts. Uh, two halves. So... Anybody brave enough to guess, remember the chapter division? Yes. 1 through 12, 13 through 28. So it's not exactly half, but the book is in two halves, two segments. So you have two books, Luke and Acts. Um, the book of Acts is in two halves. In the first half, the main character is Peter. The main city is Jerusalem, the main church is at Jerusalem, and the second half, the main character is Paul, the main city is Antioch, and the main church is the church at Antioch. All right, very good. So there, you know, you know more about Acts already than the typical church member, probably. So, uh, congratulations. All right, about 25 years ago, in fact, it was 25 years ago in November... Uh, we got a call. We were living in New Carlisle, Ohio, and um, we got a call, and I could still see. We, we, how many remember when you had the telephone hanging on the kitchen wall, right? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we had a telephone hanging on the kitchen wall, and it rang, and uh, a man said to me, my name is Bruce Lingle, and uh, we want to know if you'd be interested in candidating at Community Bible Church in Palmyra, Pennsylvania. I never heard of Palmyra, Pennsylvania. I never heard of Bruce Lingle. Although Bruce's voice, he sounded like he should be on radio. We loved his voice, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, I said I'd love to. Now this is this is really the this is before the internet is what it was today. Um, it was there was internet. We did have email, um, uh, but I, I was assistant pastor at a church in Ohio, and I had pastored five years in Florida, came back to Ohio, was five years there, and um, felt that I wanted to go back into pastoring, senior pastor. So I went online, and I found this, this uh, group called Help Ministries which was in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And all Help Ministries did was uh, churches would contact them with certain parameters of a pastor that they were, they were looking for a pastor, this is what they had in mind. And then potential candidates would send in their resume to this, to this Help Ministries. But all Help Ministries would do is to contact the the church and say, hey, we got a, we got a, a resume here that looks interesting. If you, I'll send it to you if you're interested and you can follow up. Okay, so that's, I had put my resume into uh, Help Ministries and the church had, had contacted Help Ministries, so Help Ministries told them about myself. And then Help Ministries didn't do anything else, they just was the connection point. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Bruce called, said, would you be interested? We first 
preached in November. Yeah, we first came here and preached in November. Um, they were having three or four other people come in and preach before they would decide which one to invite back as a candidate. Um, so that was November. We didn't really hear anything until March. We came back in March, preached uh, the official candidating service and, and whatever, um, was here for a week. Um, they had to vote. Uh, they, now, again, they interviewed me. They checked my credentials. A couple things they did, which I was very impressed with. They called the church that I was at and talked to the pastor there, which is very smart. And then there was a couple. I, I, I think it was Ron Stewart and Fabe. I, I could be wrong. But they, were ha they happened to be on a, a, a trip, an RV trip, and they went by the church I was at in Florida and talked to the people there. Okay. Was it, do you remember that? Was that? Yeah. It was a five. Okay. Wait a minute. I got you. I got you. Yeah. I think, yes, yes. Yeah, it's the last, I'll be first, very good. Uh, so anyway, uh, so, you know, again, they, they sent me a questionnaire, they checked my credentials, uh, checked my references, um, you know, checked my degree, all these things. And based upon that, uh, we came back in March, I was the candidate, and we preached. Um, I think we were here, we got here before Sunday, so I was, did Wednesday night, all day Sunday, Sunday night, and they had the vote. And uh, the Lambrights took us to Friendly's while we awaited the results. And as we were waiting, uh, we saw Bruce Lingle, Bruce and Barb pull into the parking lot. And Bruce got out. We're looking out the window. And Bruce goes. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is, is history. Now, that's how I was called to Community Bible Church. And, and so we came back, and our first Sunday was Easter uh, April 9th, uh, 1998. But let me tell you how the Amish choose their pastor. Okay? Were you going to say something? <laughs> I think it was. The man who could not forgive. The man who could not forgive. Very good. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's this is how the Amish By the way, there's a there's a reason for all my introduction, okay? I'll I'll get there in a minute. This is how the Amish choose their pastor. Minister probably. When being baptized, all Amish men take a vow that they will accept the responsibility of ministry if so chosen. When a new minister needs to be chosen, all male members are eligible to be nominated. In the next round of selection, so the first round is, are you a male and have you been baptized? All right. But again, when you're baptized, you are committing to allow yourself to be chosen. You can't, to, to be baptized, you, you can't say no and then be baptized, okay? So in the next round of selection, candidates select from an assortment of songbooks, one of which had a slip of paper containing a scripture verse. The bishop then inspects the book. So you're handed out, every male, baptized male is handed a songbook. Um, the bishop inspects the book to find out which man the lot has fallen on. The chosen one is ordained on the spot, and he begins his new life as a minister in the Amish church. The basis for drawing lots is found in Acts chapter 1, verses 23 through 26. So why don't you turn there, all right? The basis for drawing these lots and choosing the pastor this way is Acts 21, Acts 1, 23 through 26. Uh, 
All right, so they put forward two men, Joseph named Barsabbas, Barabbas, sorry, who also was called Justice. Uh, don't you love, you got three names here in the same, uh, and M- M- Matthias. And they prayed and said, O oh, uh, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all men, so which one of these two you have chosen to occupy the ministry and the apostles- apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place? And they drew lots for them. And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, if I had, before we had turned there, if I had asked you to name the replacement, could you have done it? Mm, some of you could. Most of us could not. Um, so the Amish look at this passage, and that's how they choose their pastor. Slip a verse in a Bible, hand out the Bibles at random. Whoever gets the Bible with the verse in it, Hey, you're our new pastor. Okay. That is not the way we do it, obviously. They believe that's the way it should be done because that's the way they did it. So here's the question. Which one of us was right? The way Community Bible Church did it? Or the way the Amish church does it? Both? Both? Well, it works in the fact that that's how they get their pastor, their minister. Did they get the best guy? I don't, I don't know, right? Um, but again, I, you, you're right. You could have got, I was the fifth one. I could have been, you know, the other four may have been better. So, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it boils down to this. I would, I, I, with this passage and other passages, and the, even the book of Acts, there's a difference between... Uh, Prescription and description. Okay? There's a difference between prescription and description. According to Marion Webster, prescription, you get a prescription. All right. The third definition is the action of laying down authoritative rules or directions. So the Amish look at that passage and they say, well, there is our rule. There it is. We, that's, that's our direction. Here's how you choose a pastor. Description, according to Merriam-Webster, definition 1B, is a statement or account giving the characteristics of someone or something. All right. So, prescription is the action of laying down a rule. Description is the, the, uh, giving an account of what happened. Those are two different things. Uh, So casting lots. Is this the prescription? Is this how, is this an authoritative rule, how it should be done? Or is it simply a description of how they did it? In fact, I would go as far as say the book of Acts. Okay. The book of Acts, is this prescription or description? Are we to are we to emulate the book of Acts? Is it laid down? rules of, of how it works, or is it simply describing how it worked? Um, we talk about genre, all right? The books of the Bible are not the same genre. Um, the Gospels are what you would call narratives or historical. They tell what happened. They describe what happened. Okay. Um, the epistles are what we would call imperatives or instructions. So the gospels are um, description. They're, 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 they're narratives. Here's what happened. Um, they're not commands. Okay. We're, we're, I, I'm not commanded to go walk on the water. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not commanded to raise the dead. There's all kinds of things that happen in the book of Acts that um, uh, fall in that category. Uh, in fact, I would put Acts in the genre of history. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are historical. They give us the history of the life of Christ and the early church. I would not put them in the uh, imperatives, in the uh, um, prescription uh, genre. They're not saying this is the way it must be done from here on out. It's saying here's the way they did it. It's not saying that this has to be duplicated or can be duplicated. All right, but here's what happened on the day of Pentecost. It doesn't say that every day should be the day of Pentecost. Okay. Um, so, casting lots. It's, it's, did Community Bible Church do wrong because they didn't take those five guys and, and flip a coin? Right? Um, is, is that the way it's, it's supposed to be done? The, the practice of casting lots is mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament. Um, in spite of the many references to casting lots in the Old Testament, nothing is, is known about the actual lots themselves. Uh, they could have been sticks of various lengths, you know, like drawing straws. You got the short straw. Um, uh, they could have been um, flat stones like coins painted on one side. Um, they could have been some kind of dice, but their exact nature is unknown. I would say probably the closest modern practice to casting lots is the flipping of a coin. Okay, So um, when I sit down and watch football today, the referee will get the guys together before the game and he'll say, this is heads, this is tails, he's going to cast the lots, you get to go first. Okay. Um, that's probably the closest thing to, to what was happening. Uh, go to the Old Testament, go to the book of Joshua. Joshua 14 as an example. Uh, what, what did they do in the book of Joshua with the lots? Anybody know? That's how they chose which tribe got which, which land. Which segment of the promised land went to which tribe? Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Now these are the territories which the sons of Israel inher uh, which the sons of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, with Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel, uh, apportioned to them an inheritance. By the lot of their inheritance, the Lord commanded through Moses, and so on. All right, look at uh, chapter 15. Now the lot for the tribe of the sons of Judah, according to their family, reach the border of Edom, and so on. And you can go on through here. Um, uh, uh, 15, 16. The, uh, then the lot, 16.1, then the lot of the sons of Joseph went from Jordan to Jericho. So, so they, they, they had uh, come, moved into the promised land. They hadn't conquered at all, but they moved into the promised land and it was to be divided up among the inheritance, as an inheritance among the, tor the tribes. And the only way to, 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 to settle who got what was to cast lots. That's how they did it. Now, obviously, they did that trusting that this was God's will. And it was. I'm not saying it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> go to, go to uh, back uh, to Numbers, the book of Numbers. Numbers 26. But the land shall be divided by lot. Numbers uh, 26.55. 
but the land shall be divided by lot. That was she, they shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. Uh, Numbers 33. Fifty-four. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger you shall give more inheritance. To the smaller you shall give less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls to anyone, this shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. Um, Thirty-four. No, yeah, 3413, it wasn't just uh, the land. Um, well, so Moses commanded the sons of Israel saying, this is the land that you are uh, to apportion by lot among you as a possession. And then look at 362. And they said, the Lord commanded uh, my Lord to give the land by lot to the sons of Israel as an inheritance. And my Lord has commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance to Zolophad, his brothers, uh, our brother to his daughters. All right. So that's how they divided up the land. <clears throat> Look at First uh, Chronicles. First Chronicles 24. Verse 5. All right, so it wasn't just the, the land that was decided by Lot. It was the duties of the, of the Levites that were decided by Lot's. 1 Corinthians 24, 5. Thus they were divided by Lot, the one as the other, for they were officers of the sanctuary and officers of God both from their descendants of Eliezer and the descendants of Ithamar. So the jobs of the Levites, of the priest, were divided up by lot. Verse 31. These also cast lots just as their relatives, the sons of Aaron, in the presence of David the king, um, Zadak, Ahimelech, and the heads of their father's households, of the priests and of the Levites, heads of their father's households as well as of his younger brother. So the various offices and function the very offices and functions of the temple were determined by lot. Again, this is how they did it, and this is how God uh, uh, got his will done. This is this is how uh, they discerned it. Again, is that is that uh, is that our marching orders? Or is that just describing how it happened? Um, it's not always a good thing, of course, but even when, uh, uh, well, go to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 7. Now, you know what happened. Jonah's in the ship. Um, Storm comes. They want to, you know, they were superstitious. They wanted to know why the storm came. Um, verse 7, each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. And he cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Now again, was Jonah the reason? Yes. <laughs> Right, so they 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 didn't know how else to determine who who the culprit was here, and it fell on on Jonah. And yes, it was Jonah that had brought God's wrath upon their ship, and they, of course, tossed him overboard. Um, casting lots eventually became a game that people played and made wagers on. Look at Matthew twenty-seven. Matthew 27, 35. 
And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. Um, so here it has no redemptive value, no, no spiritual value, no, no nothing. It was just a way to get, they didn't want to uh, tear his robe in half, so they shot dice over who would get it. Okay. Go to Proverbs 16.33. Anybody know what that says before we go there? You do probably know what it says. You're just not sure that that's the reference. Proverbs 16.33. <clears throat> the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is what? From the Lord. Yes. Now, the New Testament nowhere instructs us to use a method similar to casting lots to help with decision-making. Now that we have uh, the completed Word of God, as well as the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us, there's no reason to be using games of chance to make decisions. The Word, the Spirit, and prayer are sufficient for discerning God's will today, not casting lots, rolling dice, or flipping a coin. Um, now, to Bill's point, that's how they that's how they do it, and they're willing to 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 take that upon themselves, the, the Amish. Um, but that doesn't answer the question: Is that how? Is that the best way to do it? Um, and many, in a lot of areas, there is no right or wrong answer, right? If you want to, you know, if you can't decide which color to paint the living room, flip a coin. You're not going to sin because you, you, you painted it the wrong color, right? Now, if I'm due to have surgery and I got to make a decision about surgery, I'm not sure I just want to trust the flip of a coin, right? Um, I, want to, I want to make an informed <laughs> decision. But when it comes down to it, I still don't know. Yes, when it comes right down to it, I, I, I still don't know. Um, I, I've always taught and still believe that when you have to make a decision of where to live or what job to take or who to marry or, or whatever, you know, you, you pray for wisdom, you, you search the scriptures, and then you make your choice. Does that guarantee you'll make the right choice? No. No. Um, but this is where Romans 8.28 comes in. Right? God makes all things work together for what? Good. Even uh, to those who... who uh, uh, now I forgot... God, uh, now, I, now I got my verse messed up. <laughs> All things work together for good. Uh, yes, thank you, man. Uh, so what people sometimes are paralyzed to, to, to make a decision. But all things work together for good, even my stupid decisions. Right? Now, does that mean I should go out and make stupid decisions? Of course not. Right? I should do my research. I should, I should pray. I should bathe it in prayer. I should, uh, again, search the Word. And, and the Word will give me, um, you know, principles, but it's not going to give me answers. So, you know, like with marriage, you know, the Bible gives principles of the type of person you should marry, but you're not going to find that person's name in the Bible. Again, unless you're marrying, you know, somebody happens to have a Bible name. Uh, Rosa Sharon, so I, you know. <laughs> um, so, the, again, I, my, my, my point here is, this casting of lots, is this how, is 
is this the, the way it's supposed to be done, or is it simply telling us this is the way they did it? Well, I believe this is just happens to be the way they did it. I don't think it's telling us how we should make decisions. Okay. But let's talk about, go back to Acts chapter 1. So let's just talk a little bit about, you know, this decision. <clears throat> now, the New Testament nowhere condones or condemns the way the apostles made this decision. However, when you think of Acts or uh, Proverbs 16:33, the lot is cast into the lap, <laughs> but the decision is from the Lord. Um, you'll see that here in verse 24. So they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these you have chosen. So the first thing here to recognize is they were working um, under the uh, belief that God is sovereign. Okay, that's very important. God is sovereign. Um, of these two men, they couldn't discern a difference. So by casting lots, it was their way of saying, well, God can choose. Um, so they... Uh, um, believed in God's sovereignty. So when uh, you get to verse 26, and they drew lots from them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Um, so basically, Peter is saying Matthias was chosen by Jesus. Just like he chose us, Peter, James, John, the other apostles. Okay, He had chosen the 12. Judas had betrayed. He was dead. His office needed to be replaced. Uh, there were two equal, equally fine candidates. So uh, just as Jesus had chosen uh, the 12 originally, here's Jesus choosing the replacement by the casting of lots. Um, now, what I'd like to do, part of, part of the challenge here with this passage is what I'd like to do, I'd like to read every other mention of Matthias in the Bible. You would never hear the guy again, right? You would never hear of him again. Now, don't, don't read too much into that, okay? Because the fact is, we only really read about Peter, James, and John. We don't read anything uh, after this about Thomas or Philip. Now, not Philip the evangelist, okay, Philip the apostle, um, Bartholomew, or any of the others. So I've read some, you know, commentators looking at this passage and say, well, obviously this was not the way to do it because you never hear Matthias again. Well, yeah, but I don't hear half the other 12 that Jesus chose again either, right? Not to say they, in fact, tradition says they all spread the gospel and died as martyrs. But we just don't read that in the book of Acts, right? We don't see that in the rest of the New Testament. So I'm sure that they did just like you know, Peter and James and John did. Of course, James was martyred very early. Um, and by the way, James was martyred very early, and we don't even see them pick a replacement for him. Right? Um, as we said in our introduction or our last week, uh, although there are 26 chapters in Acts, we don't read about Peter <laughs> except once uh, after chapter 15. Well, actually, we don't read him at all after chapter 15. We don't read about John after chapter 8, except um, when uh, it's in reference to James being killed. Who do we read primarily about in the second half of Acts? Paul. So theologians love to argue, <laughs> was Matthias a mistake and Paul is the twelfth apostle, right? Um, I 
you see in Acts, look at verse um, 20, Acts 1, 20. As it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it. Now that's, again, this is in reference to Judah, or, uh, Judas. Um, and then uh, another verse, and let another man take his office. So Peter went to the scriptures. He found in the scriptures that there was to be a replacement. The, 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 the requirements for the replacement, all right, uh, verse 21, therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning with, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So we learned something here we may not have thought about before. There were many more than just the 12 that followed Jesus. There were 12 that were chosen as the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, but there were others. So when Judas betrayed the Lord and committed suicide, they had a pool of people that had, this, had the same qualifications. They had followed Jesus since the baptism of John. They had seen his death and resurrection. Uh, they were qualified. Of those, there were two particularly that showed themselves worthy, and that is uh, Bersabbas and Matthias. And they had to choose between the two. But Peter realized that there was an empty chair to fill. Um, keep your hand here, go to Matthew 19, 28. <clears throat> Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me uh, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, when he said that, of course, Judas was one of the twelve. Now, the Lord knew, Jesus knew, that Judas was not going to uh, sit on one of the thrones judging Israel. He knew he was a traitor. But nevertheless, Jesus said there's going to be 12 thrones and, and the 12 of you are going to sit on these thrones. Um, and Peter realized one of, that, those chair, one of those thrones, one of those chairs are empty. We need a replacement. Um, 1 Corinthians 15.5. Now this is, this is interesting. Paul, of course, is writing this. Uh, talking about the resurrection, okay, and how he appeared um, eventually to more than 500 people at once. But verse 5 says, Then he appeared to Cephas, and that's Peter, and then to the what? The 12. Now, here's the question. Is that symbolic because they just called him the 12? Or... Was he including Matthias? <laughs> um, if he's including Matthias, which, uh, you know, seems to be, then that answers the question about was Paul the 12th apostle? The answer to that is no. Because even Paul recognized that there were 12 apostles. The qualification, of course, is you had to see uh, the resurrected Christ. So, did Paul see the resurrected Christ? Well, yes. <laughs> On the, on the road to Damascus, All right? So as far as that goes, some would say, well, Paul wasn't qualified because he hadn't seen the resurrected Christ. Well, he hadn't seen the resurrected Christ before the ascension, but he had seen the resurrected Christ on the, the uh, road to Damascus. Let's go back to Acts. Verse 22, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, 
okay? One of these must become a witness of, with us of his resurrection. So, again, it seems to say that the qualification was to have seen Jesus bef before his ascension. Now, again, it's not of major importance if it's, if it's Matthias or, or Paul, right? Uh, I hope no church has ever split over, I'm a, I'm a Matthias, right? Uh, it, it's not really, we don't know. Now, it is interesting because of, uh, of course, uh, this verse, Revelation 21, 14. Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so in the new heaven, there will be inscribed the name of the 12 apostles. I wonder whose name it is, <laughs> right? I wonder, will there be a line in heaven waiting to look and see whose name is inscribed there, right? Uh, are you going to have... Uh, um, casting lots in line saying, I bet it's Matthias. <laughs> no, I bet it's Paul. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Here's what I do know. That's how, they, that's how they determine who the new apostle should be. But I don't believe that are our marching orders. It's that when I retire, I don't suggest you put a verse in the songbooks. And we still got the hymnals. We could bring them out. Put the verse in there. Hand them out to all the men and say, if you got the book, brother, you're the next pastor. Do you recommend we do that? No. Okay. Um, I believe that uh, we, uh, we have um, directions on better ways to do it, particularly qualifications. First Timothy chapter 3, right? Um, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. Therefore, a bishop should be uh, these things. Um, but we'll end with this. God is sovereign. If it was not his sovereign will for Matthias to be chosen, it, Matthias would not have been chosen. It would have been Barabbas. Barabbas. It could be argued that while it was God's sovereign will... Um, that he ordained for Matthias to be chosen. Um, God allowed, um, God could have allowed them to wait for Paul. But again, that's pure speculation. Paul does refer to himself as an apostle. Okay. However, the, the word apostle has the, the primary meaning of the word apostle is what, you know? Sent one. Sent one. Uh, really, it's closer to our word missionary. So you had the 12 apostles, but you had other apostles, little a if you want, that were sent. Paul does refer to himself on several occasions as Paul the apostle. The question is, again, as in the twelve, or as one that was sent by God uh, into all the world. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I do know when we get to heaven, it won't matter. <laughs> but for us who are curious, we can go and check out the wall and, 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 and see for ourselves. All right, you're dismissed.